Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Nihongo Master Podcast. I'm your host Azra and I'm looking forward to chatting with you about a new cultural topic and this one's a good one, the rich art culture of Japan. Art is one of the best windows into the character of a nation and culture and Japan has one of the richest artistic traditions in the world. It's here that probably the most famous image in the world was created, Hokusai's Great Wave. Depending on how into art and history you are, you might know a few other big names from these parts too. Yayoi Kusama's eccentric contemporary creations, or maybe Taro Kamoto's Shinto-inspired sculptures. But today, we'll be going even deeper, exploring some of the most significant styles of art styles that were cultivated in the courtly halls and artisanal workshops of this unique island nation. It's actually quite overwhelming when you think about it, to cover every area of Japanese art, from architecture to classic paintings. To name every single and every major player would take months. For now, we'll just focus on four iconic Japanese arts that shape the Japanese aesthetic tradition the most. Ukiyo-e woodblock prints, shodo calligraphy, shiki lacquerware, and ikebana flower arrangement. And as always, along the way we'll be discussing some useful vocab to use every day, whether you're hitting the art galleries or not. So let's get right into it, shall we? To kick things off, we have ukiyo-e, an art style hugely popular in the Edo era that involves the use of woodblock printing for mass production of paintings. This meant that Japanese artists were firing out cheap prints in the thousands, sending art into the homes of both rich and poor. The word ukiyo itself actually means floating world, a term used to describe the pleasure-seeking life of Japan's medieval urbanites. The e in ukiyo e means painting in Japanese. So ukiyo e basically translates to paintings of the peaceful and, for the most part, politically uneventful Edo period. The most famous print of all is, of course, the Great Wave. For those who have heard of or seen it, you probably know it by its vibrant colours and intricate details. While that was what it evolved into, ukiyo-e started off as simple as it could get, black and white prints used for illustration inserts found in books. It wasn't until the mid-Edo era when the people demanded for more that coloured woodblock printing became a thing. In those days, they were most often made to advertise beauty products or kabuki shows. That's right, the art form which brought Japanese culture to the world started off as the medieval equivalent of those annoying flyers crammed in your mailbox. Nowadays, an original ukiyo-e print can cost thousands of dollars, but guess how much you could get one from back in the day? It could be anything from 150 yen, which is equivalent to $1.50 for the smallest print, to 400 yen, about $4, for the largest. Imagine that! One of the world's most iconic art styles costed less than the cheapest McDonald's meal. Oh, if you're surprised by that, wait till you hear about how ukiyo-e was exposed to the West as wrapping paper! When Japanese traders needed something to wrap their goods in before shipping them away on boats to the Netherlands, the closest thing to hand was often an old kabuki print or a cheap hokusai piece they'd grown bored of. This was how ukiyo-e made its way to Europe, and some of the bigger names in continental art went mad for it. Vincent van Gogh himself was a collector, and the sale heavily influenced his new innovative impressionism. So, how exactly are these prints made? Well, the first most important point is that they're not just the work of a single person. Hokusai needed some helping hands to bring his masterpieces to the masses. It all starts with a publisher, who was called a Hanmoto, who commissions the prints to the artist, the Eshi. They would paint the requested picture and sends it to the Horishi, or woodcarver, who carved as many wooden blocks as needed for the picture, one block for each colour. The horishi would then pass the blocks to the surishi, an olden days printer, who would mix the paint and use these blocks to create copy after copy of the original. What a long process, right? And if I have to be honest, the toughest job here has got to be the wood covers, but unfortunately, he doesn't even get the credit. Any idea the name of the guy who carved the blocks for Hokusai? Me neither. Even though the supporting cast don't get any credit nowadays, it was a pretty lucrative trade for all involved. As you can imagine, with sometimes over 5,000 prints being made, the blocks didn't always stay pristine. For that reason, the first 200 or so prints were the most valued. This was about how much the printer could churn out in the very first week. Nowadays, these early prints fetch a pretty penny. The highest price ever paid for a Hokusai one is $471,000. 
There's one big reason that his remain the most popular and prized. Remember when I said that ukiyo-e represents the life of Edo era and how it was all about pleasure? Well, they weren't always the most highbrow art style. Ukiyo-e print subjects were commonly bijin, beautiful woman, or haiyu actors, but more specifically, kabuki actors. It was Hokusai who broke away from that tradition and started painting religious figures and landscapes instead. Ukiyo-e has travelled a long way since its early days, from being just a quick, simple piece of mass entertainment for the locals to inspiring the best Western artists of their generations. I bet if you told the people coming out of old Edo bookshops in those days that their Ukiyo-e print would one day sell for a thousand times the price they paid for, they would practically laugh in your face. While it is a classic Japanese art style, ukiyo-e woodblock printing is still alive today, though not quite thriving. If you want to give it a shot, you'll find plenty of workshops to sign up for and exhibitions which keep the memory of pioneering ukiyo-e artists alive. Here's a quick vocab recap from the woodblock printing art of ukiyo-e. E, a word used for painted pictures, sketches, and book illustrations. Hanmoto, publisher, although nowadays the more popular word is shupansha. Eshi, artist. Although a more common word for this nowadays is gaka. Bijin, beautiful woman. Hayu, actor. Although another common word for this is yaksha. Our next Japanese art has been around since the early 5th century, shodo calligraphy. However, this isn't merely calligraphy, it represents so much more. Rather than just a way to write, or kaku in Japanese, Shodo has its own set of philosophies to connect the mind and body through art. It combines literature or bungaku and poetry with spirituality through intricate configurations of brushstrokes. In fact, even though skill and practice is important in Japanese calligraphy, artists have to also master mushin, a state of mental rest and zero thoughts when your heart is free of any disturbances. This is a concept lifted straight out of Zen meditation. Japanese calligraphy is basically like a form of meditation itself, but you're painting brush lines on paper, or kami, and connecting with the kanji on the page. China was the original creator of calligraphy as a whole, and they were the ones that brought Japan into the loop. It was about the same time calligraphy was adopted as an art form that kanji was brought over as a writing system. Anyone who has had to spend hours memorizing these Chinese characters for a Japanese test will agree that that was a total disaster for language learners. But the monks of Japan loved it. Buddhism was a hot new fad at the time, and practitioners would spend hours copying out Chinese scripture in their own style. And as Japanese Buddhism became its very own thing, so too did Japanese calligraphy. With the birth of Zen Buddhism, the more cursive and expressive form developed. That was Japanese Shodo. This traditional art is deeply ingrained in the local culture and alive to this day. Not only are there specialized schools for shodo, but the Japanese people also learned the ins and outs, practice and philosophy to this art form as young as elementary school. I'm low-key jealous. Having a compulsory art class sounds like a dream to me. Half the kids I knew barely mastered finger painting. Because Japanese calligraphy went through centuries of evolution, it's only natural for it to have more than one style. Each style reflects the trends of the time it was created, or even just of the ruling ruler of the time. Kaisho is the most basic style of shodo, and also the one that students start off learning to get a good grasp of the craft. It basically translates to the square style, that became the standard style of Japanese calligraphy. These brush strokes are the closest to the original style of Chinese calligraphy, but it's also the easiest to read because of the clear-cut, boxy aesthetics. Not only that, Kaisho follows a strict guideline on which strokes comes first and what's next. Basically treat this style as the fundamentals before moving on to any other less rigid styles. If you've written any kanji yourself, then you've already dipped your toe into Kaisho. Gyosho doesn't have all those rules. Cursiveness comes more into play in this shodo style. Unlike the kaisho, the strokes aren't as clearly defined and deviate quite a bit from the standard printed characters. This moving style is like the calligrapher's style of how writers write on paper, without lifting the pen or brush in this case. One brush stroke leads to the next, opening up more creative doors for the artist to express themselves and create a unique style for themselves. 
Sosho takes the extreme end of cursive and resembles the wind-blown grass. A bit of a dramatic description, but when you see it, you'll get it. If you can't read the Gyosho script, then give the Sosho script a hard pass. This style looks pretty abstract to say the least, less about legibility and more about aesthetics. Sosho's technique is to convey the smooth and flowing sensation of writing, with each character integrating with the next. You'll see this style of shodo in most of Zen art, where the importance lies in conveying energy. You'll feel Sosho, not so much read it. If you've only just mastered hiragana and katakana, please don't freak out. No reasonable Nihongo teacher is going to test you on ancient calligraphy, unless you desperately want to read some old Buddhist scrolls. But with every style, the tools and rules are basically the same. To produce sweeping brushstrokes using a brush, or fude in Japanese, on paper. And if you're serious about your art, you won't use just any paper, but a special handmade Japanese paper known as washi. Even if you have all the authentic bits and pieces to start practicing calligraphy, it won't be worth a damn thing unless you can get in the right state of mind. When you start to paint, the verb being egaku in Japanese, you have to be totally free of distraction and really put your heart into it. A proper calligraphy critic will be able to tell if you're faking it. That's what makes a difference between some regular fancy handwriting and a true calligraphy piece which can sell for thousands of dollars. Whether you're a master painter or your handwriting looks like a toddler's scrawl, this ancient Japanese art can be a lot of fun to practice. The best part is, the better you get it, the more kanji you'll be absorbing. That sounds a lot nicer than sitting memorizing lists of 500 characters. Here's the recap from this expressive Japanese art. Kaku, to write. Bungaku, literature. Egaku, to paint. Kami, paper. Washi, Japanese handmade paper, perfect for an origami souvenir. Fude, a writing brush. If you want to specifically say a paintbrush, just add the word for painting to the start to make Efude. If you have a bit of spare cash to blow on a fancy dinner in Japan, chances are you won't be eating from standard white plates. Instead, you'll be served on dishes covered in beautiful patterns made using shiki, Japanese lacquerware. These are covered with layer upon layer of sap from poison oak trees used to make the lacquer, urushi in Japanese. While traditionally wood was used as the primary material to paint on, You'll also find glass and metal lacquer art too. Shiki has quite a history. It's probably the oldest Japanese art on this list. Dating back to the Jomon period of 14,000 to 300 BC, the earliest shiki items began popping up, with the most common historical colours being black and crimson red. It was a practical art, used mainly to decadent tableware, or shoki in Japanese. Each prefecture has their own unique method of production, and because you can't get that kind of lacquer anywhere else except there, these pieces became the perfect souvenir, or omiyage, for domestic travellers. That's where the popularity of these craft items as memento came from. Take the Wajima Nuri, for example. Originated from the Wajima city in Ishikawa prefecture, this version of shiki is the most notable of them all, to make the most durable goods possible, it has over a hundred steps in the process. Go right down to the bottom of the map of Japan, you'll find the Ryukyu Islands. If you've listened to one of our previous podcast episodes, you'll know that was the ancient name of Okinawa. This region's lacquerware, known as Ryukyu Shiki, is another pretty amazing example. The vermilion colour catches the eye, and the exotic designs like dragons and other mystical animals make them stand out among the standard plant-based designs of mainland Japan. The washoku, or traditional Japanese cuisine, boom, had a hand in bringing out these beautiful crafts into the limelight overseas. As sushi and ramen spread throughout the globe, so did the intricately crafted rice bowls, or chawan, and chopsticks, or hashi, they were served with. I'll bet more than a few of you have some imitation of shiki sitting in your kitchen cupboards. Just getting the materials for this art required some real creativity. Red lacquer was created with refined tree sap and red pigments, while the black lacquer is from the soot of burnt pines, canola oil and sesame oil. 
For centuries since the Yayoi era, 300 BC to 250 AD, those were the basic colours of Shiki. The Heian period, 794 to 1185 AD, saw a shift in Shiki technique, a new style called Makie. Gold, kin in Japanese, or silver, gin, lacquerware. Artisans would draw patterns using a brush dipped in lacquer, then sprinkle gold or silver powder over it when the lacquer was still wet. The surface would then be polished over to create a smooth texture. Makie lacquerware has always been regarded highly. Back in the day, it was only used by the upper class, and today, it's a luxury artifact. I'm betting very, very few of you have those in your cupboards. I can't imagine the patience one must have to create a product of shiki. It sounds like an intense process that requires truckloads of patience, which my family and friends would know that I don't particularly have to spare. But without a doubt, the results are more than impressive. Japanese lacquerware is said to be able to endure the harshest of conditions and last for decades of constant use. This art is so respected that to this day, there are even urushi pop artists who keep it alive, using shiki to paint things, everything from home decorations to skateboards. The 1998 Winter Olympics medals with it! So, let's recap the vocab of this meticulous craft of lacquerware. Shoki, tableware. Chawan, rice bowl. Hashi, chopsticks. Omiyage, souvenir. The Japanese love to pick up a little souvenir, usually food, whenever they visit another prefecture. Washoku, traditional Japanese cuisine. Kin, gold. Gin, silver. Both of these generally refer to the metals and the colour, but to be more specific, you can say kin iro and gin iro. Our final Japanese art is one that's as beautiful on the outside as it is on the inside. Ikebana is the traditional Japanese art of flower arrangement. If you're a flower freak like me, who enjoys putting them in a vase, then admiring their simple beauty, you'll love this one. The name is a combination of the Japanese word ikiru, meaning to live, and hana, for flower. As an aesthetically pleasing decoration in thousands of Japanese homes, offices, and galleries, ikebana compositions aren't just the result of throwing a few stems into a bowl and calling it a day. They're tied to the ideas of reflection and inner peace. Ikebana is practiced in silence, allowing the ikebanais to concentrate fully and only on the nature in front of them. This practice raises the importance of relationship building between you and the materials, the materials with each other, and you and other practitioners. All this spiritualist mumbo-jumbo show the roots of the craft. It came from religious practices way back in the 6th century, like Buddhism's traditional floral offerings and even Shinto's ceremonial practices. Over time, it became a secular activity, especially when new houses were built with a space specially to put items on display. And more often than not, they were a composition of precisely arranged vase of flowers. Then came the Ikebana specialized schools in the 15th century, where the core principles of Ikebana flower arrangements were taught and developed. Nowadays, you'll find that many little neighborhood florists even offer social Ikebana classes. Now let's take a look at some of the styles of flower arranging and the differences between them. It all began with Rikka, which translates to standing flowers. This is the orthodox style, very orderly with the tallest flowers in the center using vases or cabin, which are on the shorter end. The nageire style, on the other hand, is a bit more like punk than classical, with much less rules to follow. The name literally means to throw in. This was an extension of Zen Buddhism, more particularly the Japanese aesthetic of wabi-sabi, in which imperfection is considered beautiful. The Moribana style came after and has stuck as the most popular one of them all. This form of Ikebana maintains the freedom that Nageire had but added a few stylistic flares and conventions. Each of the three elements in a Moribana composition represents one of three things, heaven, man, and earth. Freestyle Ikebana movements even add fruit, kudamono in Japanese, into the mix. What's consistent throughout all Ikebana styles is the importance of seasonality and the flower's symbolism. The size, saizu, and color, iro, are chosen with extreme consideration. Pick a size too small and it completely disrupts the flow of the whole composition. 
you'll definitely see the Japanese iris in spring ikebana arrangements. The purple one symbolizes wisdom, while the blue one represents faith and hope. The ever-changing natural world brings constant exploration for ikebanaists. There's really no end to the possibilities. Even if you have the fundamentals down, there are still other skills of ikebana one has to master, like the technical nitty-gritties of proper cutting and maintenance, or the comprehending how a miniature adjustment changes the entire composition. So if you think flower arrangement sounds like a lot of simple nonsense, this art form will, without a doubt, prove you wrong. Let's recap the vocab from this intricate flower craft. Ikiru, to live. Hana, flower. Kabin, vase. Kudamono, fruit. Wabi-sabi, the Japanese aesthetic basically meaning perfect imperfection. Saizu, size. Iro, color. Just like we added to the end of silver, gin, to make gin iro. And that concludes our top four iconic Japanese arts. We can always learn something new from history, like taking away a thing or two from the Ikebana art to construct the perfect bouquet and match it with a handwritten letter using the techniques of shodo calligraphy. I'm just saying, boys, if you're looking to impress a Japanophile next Valentine's Day, that's the way to go. And if you're an enthusiast like myself and feel like you've dipped your toe into every art style out there, why not switch out the silk screens for wood blocks and try out the ukiyo-e art style or put aside the clay sculpture for some lacquer painted rice bowls? Japanese art has something new and exciting to discover no matter your level, whether you want to be the next great master painter or just gawk at some pretty prints in the gallery. And as I've said, there's lots more to Japanese art than just the four. So if you're interested in reading up on some other parts we couldn't cover today, head over to the Nihongo Master Blog to find out more. And if you're keen on picking up some more Japanese for yourself, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the official website to learn more about our innovative online learning system. Thank you so much for listening in. Join me next time as well, where we'll discover another unique part of Japan's culture together. Mata ne!